Hi, this is Matt Baker. Today I'm going to talk about the history of history timelines, and in particular, this one, which is known as Adam's Synchronological Chart of History, although sometimes it's also called the Time Chart History of the World. And the reason why I want to talk about this one is that although it was made over 150 years ago, it continues to be sold as an educational product, which it shouldn't be. So I'll be giving you my reasons for that opinion. As you might know, I myself am a creator of history timelines, including one that attempts to cover the entire history of the world. Now, one of the reasons why I got into creating timelines was that I personally find them to be quite useful. They kind of give you the lay of the land and allow you to see how various events relate to one another, both chronologically and geographically. However, I also find timelines to be quite beautiful, especially the really old ones. In fact, I've built up quite the collection of old history timelines. And if this video does well, I'll perhaps do more videos in which I talk about other vintage charts. But again, the reason why I chose to talk about this one is that of all the old timelines that I own, this is the one that you're most likely to see for sale on websites such as Amazon, Etsy, or eBay. So I want people to know what this chart is and why it should be seen as a piece of art rather than as an educational tool. But first, let me tell you about today's sponsor, My Heritage. It used to be that the study of history was only ever about the history of famous people. However, nowadays, thanks to websites like MyHeritage, history can also be about the history of one's own family. If you simply start with the names of your parents and grandparents, MyHeritage will use their database to automatically give you discovery links. And pretty soon, you'll have a tree that extends further back in time. One of my favorite things about MyHeritage is that it gives you access to over 19 billion historical records, things that you cannot find using Google. I'm talking about birth certificates, military records, newspaper articles, and more. For example, I was able to find this census list from 1911 that names my great-great-grandfather Richard Hutt and gives me lots of information about him, including his birth date, ethnicity, religion, and occupation. So if you'd like to learn the history of your own ancestors, MyHeritage is offering Useful Charts viewers a 14-day free trial, followed by 50% off a premium membership. You can sign up right now by using the link in the description or pinned comment. One of the first people to try and capture all of world history on a single page was an Englishman named Joseph Priestley who published this new chart of history in 1769. He was a good friend of Benjamin Franklin, and in fact, he dedicated this chart to him, as you can see here. The horizontal axis of this chart represents the flow of time, with each line representing 100 years. Vertically, the chart is arranged by continent, with the Americas on top, followed by Africa, Asia, and then Europe. However, note that the section on the Americas is limited to post-colonial times, and Africa is limited to North Africa. At the very bottom is a list of who the author considered to have been the most important rulers during each time period. He starts with the biblical kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, and then ends up with the kings of England and Great Britain. So obviously, this is a very 18th century English way of looking at history. You start with the Bible, and then you end up with Europeans ruling most of the world. A couple decades later, in 1804, a German man by the name of Friedrich Strauss published his own take on world history. Shown here is the English version, titled Universal History Illustrated, and subtitled The Stream of Time Made Visible. This one is oriented differently, so that now, time flows from the top of the page towards the bottom. However, the most important change is that each civilization is now represented as a river or stream that waxes and wanes, and sometimes even merges into other streams. So for example, near the beginning, you get many ancient civilizations that eventually become part of the Persian Empire, 
which then flows into Alexander's empire, which then breaks up into many new streams, before, once again, all those streams flow back into a single river, which this time is the Roman Empire. You can even trace the eastern half of the Roman River all the way down to where it gets swallowed up by the Ottoman Turk River, which then continues to the bottom where it becomes Turkey and Greece. So, looking at this chart, you can obviously see that it was the main inspiration for Adam's chart, which is the chart we'll be looking at for the rest of the video. Adam basically just turned this one on its side and then made it way, way longer and much more detailed. So at this point, let me now tell you a few basic details about Adam's chart. First of all, when I say Adam, I'm referring to Sebastian C. Adams, who is the man who made the chart. This is important because, unfortunately, to this day, his chart is often mistakenly credited to Edward Hull. I'll come back to the reasons for that a bit later. Sebastian Adams was born in Ohio, but then ended up in Oregon, where at various points in his life, he worked as a county clerk, church minister, school teacher, business owner, and even state senator. In 1871, when he was in his mid-40s, he published the Adams Synchronological Chart or Map of History the cover page of which usually looks like this, although originally it was sold as a scroll. Now, the next thing you need to know about this chart is that it is really, really big. I don't think anyone has ever, either before or after Adams, tried to publish a timeline as big as this one. It's around 2 feet tall and over 20 feet long. Here's a copy of mine unfolded on the sidewalk. For this reason alone, I think it's worth owning one, so long as you understand that it's more of a historical curiosity item or art piece than it is something that you could use as a reference. So why is that? Well, let's dive into it. First of all, Adam's chart is based on a literal interpretation of the biblical book of Genesis. In other words, it's based on the idea that humanity began with Adam and Eve approximately 6,000 years ago. Specifically, it uses the timeline developed by Anglican Archbishop James Usher way back in 1654. Usher famously calculated that creation took place in 4004 BC. So that's the starting date used on this chart. Now, for a lot of people, the fact that this chart starts with Adam and Eve is enough for them to conclude that this is not a chart that they want to take seriously. However, I don't want to focus all of my attention simply on this point, because there are some Christians out there who do think that history began 6,000 years ago. And even for those people, I am still going to argue that they shouldn't be using this chart, at least not for history. Now, the first 1,656 years on the timeline is simply a genealogy of the descendants of Adam. And I actually think that this part of the chart is pretty good. I mean, don't get me wrong, I personally don't consider Genesis to be real history. But I do consider Genesis to be an important work of ancient literature. And this chart does a great job at helping the reader to understand the various time spans involved in that work of literature. For example, it makes it clear that Adam, the first man, actually lived to see not only the birth of his son and grandson, but also his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandson, Lamech, the father of Noah, which is something that's not really made clear in the Bible unless you do the math. It also makes it clear that Methuselah, who was supposedly the oldest man to ever live, died in the same year as the flood, perhaps even in the flood. And this section of names actually keeps going for another 900 years. So interestingly, you can see that according to the numbers given in the Bible, Shem, the son of Noah, was still alive when Abraham and Isaac were born. But let's back up to approximately 2300 BC, which is when this chart really begins. You can see right here that it begins with the Tower of Babel, which according to the Bible is when humans were divided into various language groups. So initially, we get five streams coming out from this event. Canaan, Egypt, Babylon, Greece, and China. 
Which brings me to my second point. If we toss aside the question of whether or not the biblical stuff should be there, and just look at the history shown from this point forward, the fact is, this chart gives you a very limited view of world history. In the beginning, it mostly focuses on the Middle East together with Greece and Rome, and then later it focuses almost entirely on Europe, which in a sense is understandable considering that this chart was made in the Victorian era. In the 1800s, Western historians simply didn't know as much about the rest of the world. But, and this is the most important point of this video, we are now living in the 21st century, and we know way more about world history than the Victorians did. Obviously, history itself doesn't change. However, our ability to understand history does. So why use a 150-year-old, incredibly out-of-date chart as a reference for understanding history when there are much better sources available today? Let me give you just a few examples of what this chart misses early on. During this period, when this chart shows just five streams, there were actually lots of other interesting things happening in other parts of the world. For example, in South America, there was the Norte Chico civilization which built large cities, like this. And in North America, there was the Poverty Point culture, which built complex settlements, like this. From Adam's chart, you get the idea that nothing ever happened in Africa outside of Egypt. But this is simply not true. What about the Kerma culture in Nubia? It produced large cities, like this. And where's India? China gets a mention, but not India, which to me is strange. By this point, the Indus Valley Civilization was firmly established, one of the most advanced civilizations of the early Bronze Age. So as you can see, whether you take Genesis literally or whether you do not, either way, there is still a lot missing from this chart. And it's not just at the beginning. As we move on, there are so many major things missing. There is no mention of the Olmecs or the Mayans in Mesoamerica. No mention of the Aksumite Empire in Ethiopia. No Mauryan Empire or Gupta Empire in India. I mean, the Buddha doesn't even show up. In fact, India as a whole doesn't show up until around the year 1500, when Babur founds the Mughal Empire. Which by this point on the timeline is no longer about a lack of knowledge. So my third point is going to be very frank. This chart is undeniably racist. You see, in the 19th century, which, remember, was when this chart was made, Europeans not only divided the world into white and non-white, they even had multiple categories of non-white, as demonstrated by this map. To the Victorian mind, only the yellow areas on this map were considered civilized. The green areas, which included the Ottoman Empire, India, and China, were considered half-civilized. So I guess that was kind of a compliment in a weird racist sort of way. But then there's the red area, which represented barbarians who lived mostly in Africa and on the Eurasian steppe. But if you think that label is bad, the Victorians went even further. They had a category below barbarians, which they called savages. This they reserved mostly for Native Americans or for other indigenous people groups, such as those living in the Amazon, Australia, or Siberia. And this attitude can clearly be seen on Adam's chart. I mean, look how small the Tang dynasty of China is compared to the size of the Roman Empire. Even Genghis Khan, who built the largest land empire in history, appears on the chart as if he was just some minor, insignificant ruler. Also missing is Mansa Musa, ruler of the Mali Empire and the richest man of all time. Then there's this, which serves to perpetuate the long discredited Victorian view that humans can be divided neatly into exactly five races. The drawing used for the non-white individuals are all based on extreme stereotypes, especially that of the African. He seems to be based on this chart, which insinuates that blacks are closer to apes than whites, 
which of course is a bunch of BS. But finally, I have a fourth point. And this goes back to the fact that this chart is simply out of date. And that is, even for the civilizations that it does show, it often gets things wrong, especially when it comes to ancient history. Again, this is because the people who lived 150 years ago simply didn't know any better. A lot of the archaeology that we now rely on to understand places like Egypt and Mesopotamia simply hadn't happened yet. So it appears that this chart is relying either on some really old sources or it is simply basing things on guesswork. I'm going to use Egypt as an example. The first ruler of Egypt is shown as being Bucyrus around 2100 BC. But Bucyrus was not a historical pharaoh. He's simply a character that shows up in Greek mythology as having been killed by Hercules. The actual first ruler of all Egypt was Narmer, who lived about 1,000 years before this. But what's really strange is that the Great Pyramid of Giza is shown here, with a note saying, date uncertain. But then Cheops is shown here, with a note saying, built the Pyramid of Giza. Even though Cheops, also known as Khufu, built the Great Pyramid way back in 2600 BCE, which is much farther back than both of these placements. Then there's Ramses the Great, who is laughably shown before Cheops, even though Ramses was a new kingdom pharaoh and Cheops was an old kingdom pharaoh. He's also combined with Sesostris, who was likely Senesret III, a middle kingdom pharaoh. So yeah, everything is basically all jumbled up. So if you're wanting to familiarize yourself with ancient Egyptian history, please do not use this chart. However, like I say, so long as you don't use this chart as an actual reference tool, I do recommend getting a copy of it if you're at all interested in the history of history timelines. It provides an interesting glimpse on how history was viewed during the Victorian era. And from a design point of view, there's simply nothing like it. Let me now end by telling you a bit about the various versions of the chart that are out there, most of which sell for under $50. If you see one that has a cover like this, that's going to be the original Adams synchronological chart, which is the one that I recommend because after all, I'm recommending this as an art piece, not as a reference tool. Because this thing is so old, the copyright on it has long since expired, which means that you can also download the whole thing in an electronic format for free on Wikipedia, no less. I'll leave a link to that in the description. And because it's now in the public domain, any publisher can now print and sell it, which is why it tends to be available for a relatively cheap price. However, this is also why you get so many different versions of it. Because over the years, different publishers have made some slight changes. The most important one happened early on when a company called Deacons from the UK got the permission to print it they made two major changes. First, near the beginning, they replaced this section with some maps made by a professor named Edward Hall. And second, at the very end, they tacked on a geological chart, again made by Edward Hall. Therefore, the new title became Deacon's Synchronological Chart, pictorial and descriptive of universal history with maps of the world's great empires and a complete geological diagram of the Earth drawn by Professor Edward Hall. So this is where the confusion set in. Edward Hall only drew the maps and the geological diagram, but the way the title was worded, it made it seem like he had drawn the whole thing, which he didn't. But to this day, because of this poor wording, Edward Hall is often listed as the author, not Sebastian Adams even in cases where Edward Hull's contributions have since been replaced, such as on the various time chart history of the world versions. These versions are easily found on Amazon and in local bookstores, but I actually like them the least because they really muddy the waters. They take the last part of the chart, which originally ended in 1871, and they extend it all the way to today which at first seems cool 
except when you realize that 90% of the chart is exactly the same and still represents a very racist, very incorrect Victorian view of world history. They even put an evolution chart at the beginning to make it seem like the chart is providing you with two different views. But again, the actual history on the history chart is the same. And even though we've learned loads of new things about history over the last 150 years, none of this has been incorporated into the chart. So to me, this is very confusing to the buyer. It seems like this is an up-to-date reference tool, when really, it is not. Okay, so that was a look at Adam's synchronological chart of history. If you liked this video and would like to see me do more videos like this, where I go through old charts or charts made by other publishers, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.